Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, we're going to be talking about end of life doulas. Who do we have on with us today? End of life doulas. We are delighted to welcome Jane Euler, who is lead doula and co founder of Present for You, which is a benefit LLC company that provides doula support at the end of life. Jane, welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. Thank you for having me. And we're delighted to welcome John Lochnane, who is a palliative care doctor and end-of-life doula and co-founder of Present For You. He's joining us from Boston. Jane's joining us from Virginia. John, welcome to Jerry Pal. Nice to be here. And we're delighted to welcome Beth Clint, who is executive director of Goodwin Hospice and is joining us from the D.C. and Northern Virginia area along with Jane. Welcome to Jerry Pal, Beth. Hi. So again, we're going to be talking about end-of-life doulas. I have a lot of questions because I have never worked with an end-of-life doula in my 20 years of doing palliative care. But before we jump into that topic, John, do you have the song request for Alex? I do. Um, It's Jimmy Buffett's uh, song, uh, Bubbles Up. It was on his last album. As you may know, Jimmy Buffett passed away in August of a rare skin cancer. And when I heard Bubbles Up, um, I was uh, really struck by two things. One is... It is about um, how to get through hard times. Uh, Bubbles Up is following Bubbles Up, as the song will elucidate. And then second, you know, I I was someone who uh, was a parrot head for years and years. It was just amazing how the community came together. And that was really the theme song of how the community came together. How do you see the light? How do you move through uh, difficult times in your life? I was actually, I think, started for veterans. And then uh, over time, it metamorphosized as as Jimmy reached the end of his life. Um, I'll also add. What was that called? You were a what? Um, a parrot head. <laughs> parrot head. It's like the people who follow Jimmy Buffett. It's like, it's like from the to translate San Francisco, it's like deadheads, right? Deadhead. I get it. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, uh, that, back in college, I worked, <laughs> I worked security uh, at a Jimmy Buffett concert. And uh, did. It, it's, it's very hard not to get high secondhand on a Jimmy Buffett concert. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say this. People are older these days. And, and the last thing I'll say is I actually saw his very last performance. I happened to wow. go to an outdoor show with his uh, his his wingman, uh, Mac McNally, and Jimmy Buffett showed up for his last time ever in public to sing. Uh, he looked very ill. My wife is also yeah. a physician, said he's dying. I didn't want to believe it. But uh, so I thought it was mm-hmm. apropos. Uh, Jimmy Buffett yeah. was a was a doula for a lot of people. Maybe not an end of life doula, but he was a doula. <laughs> yeah, well said. Yeah, this 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 is a great choice. I understand it was re- released after he died. And yes. you can tell he was thinking about the end of his life in this song. Great choice. I still have a broken hand, so I figured out how to play this with two fingers. Here we go. Here's a little bit. When this world starts reeling From that pressure drop feeling We're just treading water each day There's a way to feel better Be well set to weather The storms till the sun shines again When your compass is spinning And you're lost on the way Like a leaf in the wind Friend, hear me when I say A bubble's up They will point you toward home No matter how deep Or how far you roam They will show you the surface The plot and the purpose So when your journey gets long Just know you are loved, there is light up above, and the joy is always enough. A bubble's up. That was lovely, Alex. Yay. Thank you. Fun choice. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And very apropos of the subject, so let's jump into end of life doulas. Jane. What is an end-of-life doula? (laughs) Right, right. So an end-of-life doula is a non-medical support person that provides a longitudinal uh, relationship with aspects of companionship, presence, holding space, some logistics, um, some practical help, 
decision making, perhaps. And all of this really turns into a an emotional partnership with someone. Mm-hmm. And this we we are doulas for those with uh, serious illness and those at end of life. Uh, just a, a, a longitudinal relationship, non medical support uh, to provide presence. And is end of life doula, death doula, what's the proper terminology? Are they the same? They are the same, right? End of life doula or death doula. And uh, recently I was working with a woman who um, has glioblastoma, young woman, and her mother in law called me a brain cancer doula. So, <laughs> you know, what, whatever, whatever works in the situation, just a non medical support partner. Yep. <laughs> and I'd love to hear each, from each of you kind of how you got interested in this. But before we do, Jane, um, is What's the history? Is this like a new thing, end of life doulas? Has it been going on for a long time? I know I've heard a lot about uh, like birthing doulas, labor um, and delivery. Kind of that's kind of where I've heard of doulas. How long has been a death doula or end of life doula been around? So we're following behind the you know the birth doula um, movement. I would say you know fifteen to twenty years uh, death doulas have been around. There's an organization that I took my training from, which began I want to say in 2012. So it's been been around for a while. It was it was started by a social worker who um, really just saw some some gaps in care with those at end of life, particularly those with chronic long term illness. Uh, you know, having the having important conversations, we do we do do um, conversations on goals of care and advanced care planning as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, that sort of overlaps a little bit with the palliative space. Um, so maybe fifteen to twenty years. Yeah. Wow. And then, John, I'd love to hear from you. Starting off, um, you're a palliative care doc, right? You know, I, I've been a, I, I, I call myself, I am what I am, which is a family practice doctor. So whenever I take care of a patient, I, I see myself as a family practice doctor, but I've been a hospitalist. I've been a primary care doctor uh, and I've done palliative. Uh, so, but in the end, I, I see these as my patients yeah. and I'm trying to define what is the right model. And I think what really called me to being an end of life doula was during a COVID and just realizing again and again, which I kind of already knew the limitations of my medical training, my medical interventions, and bluntly how freeing it was not to have the role of a physician walking into a situation where people make, you know, already have like figure out what they need to ask you, what the power differentials are. So during the pandemic, I uh, trained at uh, the University of Vermont, where Jane also went to, to try to figure out how I could be of help and service in a different modality, right? Um, even though, uh, as you know, as you go in and your doctor so and so, which is not what you usually use, it sets expectations, it sets boundaries, it sets limitations, it sets space between us and the individuals we're trying to take care of. And I really found that being an end of life doula had a different opening of people's hearts. I often say that you know doulas are mirrors, providers are not. Uh, providers, you know, tend to people want answers and determinations and decisions. Doulas yeah. are reflections. And, uh, and I think that's a crucial aspect that really drew me to it. That's that's fabulous. I, I want to hear more about that, especially that that probably hard role doing, you know, crossing the between the two and w- whether or not you have to set up boundaries. But I want to hear from the others for us too. Jane, how did you get interested in this? So my mother died about 12 years ago and um, she didn't have, looking back on it, it wasn't necessarily well, I think it could have been better for her and for me. I was alone with her in, um, you know, the end of a long hallway at a, a nursing home, um, you know, health center. And a few years later, I was reading an article about death doulas, and I thought, you know, I should have had someone like that with me. Um, they could have said, Jane, why don't you get in the bed with your mother, which she would have loved. I just that just didn't even occur to me. Yeah. Or I should be playing music, or I should be, you know. And I just wasn't using the time that I had, which was not much time, like I maybe should have. And so that sort of uh, dawned on me. And then I did a lot of introspection and realized that I've actually been doing this for folks um, in an informal way, church family, church members and uh, friends. 
but I didn't do it so well with my own mother. So I thought that was, you know, an interesting take on doing this because um, that, you know, a mother daughter relationship that can be complicated, can be wonderful. And I just, it's a hard, you know, it's hard to navigate when you lose your mother. So I thought if I could do this for other people, I said, that would just really please my heart. So I, you know, I spent 32 years in information technology, would you believe, and uh, switched over to this full time a few years ago. Um, and it really has been transformational for me to be hold, to hold space with people in this time of such uh, emotion and angst and mm. love. And then lastly, Beth, from your perspective, so you're not a doula, uh, is that correct? That is correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you are the executive director of a large nonprofit hospice, Goodwin Hospice. Where did you start intersecting with doulas? Um, so I'm a nurse by training, um, and then obviously the executive director. And um, I've worked with end of life doulas in hospice, generally in a volunteer role, and usually in hospice at um, you know sitting bedside vigil, um, but having someone a, a supportive presence. So that had been my experience. And then um, I met Jane, and we were just talking about healthcare in general, and you know, how we have patients who are losing their loved ones and they're like, how mind blowing it is that they're losing a partner of 70 years. And just what would that be like to to have to watch someone that you can't really even remember your life without? And, you know, how the healthcare providers, we come and we provide support, but we're there to meet the needs. But then once the needs are met, we need to move on. And that sometimes the needs are just not being alone. And having someone to be able to be there and healthcare, just the way healthcare is structured, we're not, that's not something that that's feasible unless there's a specific symptom management need that allows for more care. But just to provide simple care doesn't exist. And wouldn't that be lovely if we could support our staff so they could feel like their resident or their patients would have that support should they need it since we weren't able to provide that kind of support. So I got to ask the question then, what's the difference between an uh, end-of-life doula and a hospice volunteer? Um, there, it, it depends on the volunteer. Hospice volunteers do lots of things. Um, they're not all end-of-life doulas. Many, you know, many of them are companions or do shopping or you know, will come and read. Um, so volunteers can do any sort of thing, have, you know, uh, therapy dogs. So we have volunteers that do a lot of different things, but an end of life doula um, in hospice is meeting a need. And the struggle that we had found is that volunteerism, you're, you're totally relying on volunteers and that's based on availability and needs don't come up when available needs come up when they come up. And so Having a partnership with someone that made sure we'd be able to provide end-of-life doula services should there be a need, um, we have a relationship with present for you. Yeah. And yeah. that's volunteerism. Yeah, and I would add, too, volunteers are wonderful, but I think there's two differentiations here. One, as I talked a little bit about this, is, is a mirror, right? A volunteer brings a service. I think doulas are much more about defining what services are needed and then figuring out how to create the, the care around that situation. Um, and I think that's that's crucially important. Two, I do think there's consistency with the doula training. Um, there's a consistency of understanding and approach that I think is helpful. So as we all know in healthcare, in general, there, there are people have to need a knowing. You know, I remember when I first worked with birth doulas at a large West Coast university where I was doing my residency, there were, there were rules a little bit, right? Because the healthcare system likes to have some level of consistency as people move in. To go back to your point, and I think part of our goal at present for you is not to be end of life doulas, but to be serious illness doulas, you know, to be able to bridge serious illness to palliative to end of life. And I think that consistency of what is expectation of our roles is crucial in in a lot of ways. But that role is determined by the individuals we're serving. And And I actually think that our superpower is that we are not role defined. We can come into a situation. We, you know, a nurse enters a situation and needs to be a nurse. Um, whereas a doula can enter the situation and, you know, figure out where, where the needs are in conversation with the family. So this is interesting because you know, this all kind of reminds me. So we did a coaching podcast 
And a similar thing is, again, what a coach is may look very different um, from one coach to another coach. Does everybody get the same training? What does the training look like? And right. is there okay. some uniformity? There, it's a little bit of the wild west <laughs> still. A bit. Um, it, you know, you um, are only a certified end of life doula by the organization that trains you. There is no um, uh, licensing or overarching, you know, body that, that that oversees this at the current time. There are. I can name probably 10 organizations across the United States uh, where you can get education on being an end-of-life doula, and they're all slightly different. Uh -huh. uh, uh, the basic part, the, the the fundamental part is being present, I think, and holding space for people. And some some doulas, you know, move into the, um, the, the kind of fu home funeral and celebrant space. Um, others are more very dedicated to legacy, working on legacy projects and dignity therapy and, you know, uh, videos and photo albums and quilts and all of those things. So it kind of depends on your niche uh, and everyone is different. So we have one doula who is really well-trained and well-experienced in advanced um, care planning. And that's kind of her thing that she does. So it just sort of depends. So when I try to think about what a doula does, what does a, a do? Should I call it a consult? That's probably too medical. I'm using my medical brain. Um, visit. A partnership. A partnership. A visit. I, I what is a, a typical visit from? A, well, like, well, not a, a visit, but I kind of the the what like services can we think are offered by a, a doula? Like when should I think of one? Beth, do you want to? Do you want to? tackle that, you know, how, yeah. what the social work oh, yeah, is. Beth, like from a hospice standpoint, when do you think, oh, this person needs a doula? So um, from a hospice standpoint, we obviously have the nursing support, social work, chaplaincy. We have volunteers. We have CNAs. We provide a lot of care to um, someone receiving services from Goodwin Living. But I think what an end of life doula does is when we find ourselves um really trying to provide, to kind of meet people where they are and walk them through what to expect. We kind of do it through a medical lens and we're planning for what the needs are. But, you know, a lot of times the needs are quite simply just normalizing where you are. It's not all the medical stuff. And that just takes time and being present. And we don't have the luxury of as much time, unfortunately, as other end of life doulas do like we have to do our assessment our documentation all of the things that we need to do from uh providing good care and then also from a regulatory and, and to be filling the roles that we're there providing and frankly what we're being reimbursed for and so you know having someone that can be present and really meet people where they are and give them the time and the space to kind of walk through what's happening is something that unfortunately we don't get to do all the time, but having a resource available does take away that feeling of like, I know there's a need, but I just can't give them everything they need. I have, but I have a resource to help me provide that. And, and I think this, to answer your question, everybody deserves a doula. Uh, so I would invite you as a palliative care provider to think about everybody deserves a doula uh, <laughs> because there's no downside. You know, I think that that's not something really interesting, which again, that I talk about that role-based component. When we go in there, we have a job to do, shall I say, uh, however that job is defined. And again, I go back to this and, you know, Jane and I have taken care of some folks together as doulas and it's very different, right? That the, the role is defined by the individual of what they need. Um, and I found that to be the biggest difference you asked earlier. When I go in is I never go in as a doula and a, and a provider. I, I go in as a doula or a provider. And it's turning off the medical brain. It's I go in as a provider saying, tell me what's going on. I synthesize it as I've always been trained to do. As a doula, I don't synthesize as much. I try to open myself up to understanding what their needs are, in, in essence, and not bringing any of my my brain. I, I really do mean this. It's like my brain's there, but I want to hear what they are so mm -hmm. I can reflect back and say, what what is going on? So to tell me how you can help. Tell me how I, I can help broadly defined, right? It must Not be hard like, though, John, because like you probably go into situations where something triggers your medical brain. Yes. That, you know, that, that fix it mode that 
doctors are often trained in problem, fix it, problem, fix it. Do you have a hard time separating that? And like, what happens when you you're in someone's home and they need a doctor? Remember, I'm I'm a hospitalist. I learned a long time ago <laughs> how to let it go. <laughs> but Eric, Eric, we have come to the conclusion that yes. John is a better physician than he is doula. So there you go. <laughs> but the doula, the doula component has helped me be a better physician. Uh-huh. Right. So I think what it is, you ask a really good question. It's how do I, and I've done this recently is a, how do I defer it and get back to the the the, the licensed providers taking care of the patient yeah. with ended non-judgmental suggestions? So you can go in there and say, hey, listen, I'm working with this patient as a doula. This is what I saw and heard. No yeah. recommendations, but this is what I saw and heard. I think the family would like you to consider how to how to how to work with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's like interesting because a lot of doulas too, like not a lot, but or I'm guessing some because I've read a lot of articles yeah. are uh, social workers and nurses, nurses. Uh, yeah. past hospice nurses. Um, so it's not just like the your boundary, John, but I'd imagine setting boundaries right. as a doula may be important, especially since some of it is relatively undefined. Is that right, yeah, Jane? That, yeah, that's right. And I, you know, because I don't come from a clinical background, so I have a whole different set of language and, you know, the way I approach something than than someone with a medical background. And we know, you know, the medical system is, is fairly transactional, you know, nothing against the medical system, but <laughs> it's kind of transactional. And this is not that. This is organic. This is uh, emotions. This is the non-medical part of someone being ill. Jane, uh, one thing that I didn't hear as much in when people were saying, you know, who who is a doula for? What's appropriate? What are the triggers to start thinking? Oh, we should try and get a doula involved. One thing I didn't hear was prognosis, and I wonder: is this only for patients in hospice? Is this for patients who are at earlier stages, who have longer than six months left to live? Yes. Is that yeah? And are there triggers there that our listeners should? should look for and think about uh, when they're thinking, uh, you know, this, this might be a situation which we should call in a death doula. Right. If you're, if you're having angst about the, a new diagnosis, if you aren't um, getting answers that you need, if you need an advocate, if you need someone who's been in this space before, if you're having family conversations that aren't necessarily going well with respect to treatment and, you know, looking at prognosis, bring in someone who can bring the, the, uh, the group together. I often think that bringing an outsider in helps the conversations that I have with the loved one that may be, you know, entering a serious illness or maybe dying can open up in ways that maybe they can't to their daughter. Well, actually, I think everyone deserves a doula. But, you know, if you're going to be recommending, uh, you know, I would say when there is gaps, there's care that needs to be given from the human aspect and not the medical. And that could be, um, you know, anything from just advocacy or conversations. So, so Alex, I'll ask you, uh, as we're doing the dinner table conversation, how do you know someone's going to die in six months anymore, right? Our yeah. folks all die of congestive heart failure, dementia, even oncology diagnoses with new immunotherapies aren't like the old days, right? And I'm aging myself a little bit. So I'd love to ask you and Eric, when when do you think you need that level of support? At what point were you engaged with the patients, either as a geriatrician, primary care, or uh, a palliative care or hospice? When is when do you think there's like that point where you think that extra layer of support with a human focus is is most helpful? Yeah, well, I'd agree, John. Like for palliative care, ideally starts around the time of diagnosis, and that's where we have the largest evidence base for palliative care in the outpatient setting, in the setting of serious illness, around the time of diagnosis. I don't know what evidence exists for doulas. Another question I'd love to ask. And we're talking about death doulas, right? That's the name of the podcast, death doulas or end of yeah. life doulas, right? Like that is not around the time of diagnosis. It's not like serious illness doulas. It's death doulas, end of life doulas. And we're so all dying now, like slowly. <laughs> right. Well, that is part of the question, right? Like, yeah. Death in the name or end of life in the name, isn't that a barrier to like, Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, we don't want to be death doulas. We want to be serious illness doulas. We have had this conversation a million times, Alex, about what to really call ourselves because, you know, we we want to be effective at, you know, and, and helpful in a longitudinal rela- relationship beginning at onset of serious illness because I, I think there's value there. It's just, you know, getting the word out. People don't know that this is a resource. Uh, and I think I think this sort of came about with this whole death positive movement that you may have heard about and death um, cafes, right? I, I I do I've done many death cafes and all that. And um, there's a, a funeral director down in Southern California, Caitlin Dowdy. Do you have you run into her? She's sort of credited with this sort of um, death positive movement. But I think the baby boomers, of which I am one, um, you know, we don't want to die in the medical way that our our parents did. We you know we we want some other things. We want to um, you know talk about meaning, giving giving bringing meaning to it actually bringing some intention to the end of life space, which has traditionally been just medicalized. So I think so dualism, if, that's what yeah, it is. This is that, um, you know, we talked about how far before death end of life doulas come on. We also hinted at like there's stuff that end of life doulas do after death. And how does that, I mean, we talk about the differentiation between palliative care and hospice and, end of life doulas. What's the difference between funeral home directors, mortuaries and end of life doulas? Right. So, you know, funeral, there's licensing things that go along with being a yeah, funeral director, yeah. no funeral home. At our present for you currently, we work with a funeral home I have. And so does actually Goodwin Hospice, the, the same woman who, um, woman based owner, of a uh, small funeral home here. She's also a celebrant and she can be called in and we work with her a lot, but you can um, be be certified as a celebrant and some doulas are absolutely doing that. And, you know, that's getting a little off topic because that's after death. But I think with what doulas do is, you know, reprocessing and helping with some grief, we can. With Goodwin hospice patients, not as much because they have that support from the bereavement group at Goodwin Hospice. But our direct to consumer or our private pay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing follow ups quite a bit with just just reprocessing, you know, what happened. And, you know, it's a story and the story is it likes to be told again and again. And um, for that story to be um, not so horrible <laughs> um, is is what we try to do because the people that are left, the family are left, are going to tell the story again and again and again. So we help with that. And John, you mentioned everybody should have a doula. There's no downside. I'm going to push back. There's always a downside to everything okay. that we do. And the one that I can think about is there's always time. <laughs> And even like a hospice volunteer, uh, there are downsides because now you got to train hospice volunteers. There's there's always some sort of downside. Who pays for end of life doulas? Yeah, so that's it's a very good question. Good so, question. Um, so I think that, um, and I'd love to get Beth's two cents. So I'll give you sort of why I was also drawn to the end of life doula component. You know, I, I, I my entire career has been taken care of in primary hospitals and palliative. Uh, underserved populations, either dual eligibles, Medicaid and Medicare, or community health centers. So I've always worked in that environment. And in fact, when I, I worked for a senior care options payer provider in Massachusetts, where I am I'm coupled um, end of life care from hospice uh, back in 2009. It looks a little bit like VBID back in 2009, because I realized that the populations are traditionally underserved and have a mistrust of the healthcare system. Uh, discussions around end of life, death, and hospice are not popular. In fact, um, are extraordinarily difficult. So um, the reality is, but those folks don't get enough hospice benefits. I think everybody should be in, in Goodwin Hospice and Beth services long before uh, they're at the end of their life. But there are so many barriers among those who have distrust in the healthcare system. So um, the reality is, is how do you pay for it right now? This is one of the barriers. And the reason why we made a benefit LLC was to try to broaden the component of, of having representative workforce and communities to open this up to discussions and to open uh, open doors to people to talk about this in whatever way they want to talk about it that will translate into earlier, higher quality um, you know, journey of serious to palliative end of life. So the, the primarily way end of life doulas are paid in the United States right now are direct to consumer. Uh, and- someone purchased direct to consumer 
processing of it. Um, we, uh, and I'd love best too on this, we have uh, Beth through her organization pays for our services at this point. But in the end, if, if doulas are truly going to reach their full potential, they're going to have to find a, a structured payment system. As you know, birth doulas in a lot of states are now being paid by Medicaid and some private payers. Uh, we see a huge uh, opportunity for, for doulas in general to be based under value-based systems, yeah. whether it's you know, reach, SCO programs, or other con uh, controlling factors. We think uh, end of life doulas combined with hospice are a powerful way to get patients into more aligned care uh, much earlier. But I'd love to get Beth's per perception of this. Yeah, Beth, uh, there was a lot of talk about the value uh, for doulas. What was the value proposition? Goodwin pays for the doula? So, yes, we do. We pay for the end of life doulas through our foundation. So we offer a couple of different services or complementary services that are not covered under the traditional hospice Medicare benefit. Um, and so we utilize the generous donations from our foundation to support the end of life doula program. What I'm guessing there had to be an argument like the value proposition. What was the value proposition? Do you, can I you think, share? Yeah. I mean, I think for us, why we felt like it was important was um, a staffing issues. I think one of the things that really spoke to me was the amount of pressure that's on the healthcare system and healthcare providers in general, and um, especially after the pandemic, and how many people within the healthcare system are still, you know, are still kind of working through the experience of the pandemic and we're still facing the experience of it. Um, and so I was really trying to find ways to think outside the box to support our staff and to allow them to be able to do the care that they love, um, but also to not feel the pressure of the world on them to be able to meet all of the needs, which personally I feel are greater. Yeah. Um, and so this was a way that we could offer a support not only that would provide better care, you know, quality care and, and better care, but also more patient-centered care and also take care of our staff. Did it turn out the way you wanted it to? I would say yes. I think um, we're still learning um, how to use end-of-life doulas. I don't think, you know, I think there are times where I think, did we think about this? And someone's like, oh, no, I didn't. And that's kind of frustrating, but it's an ongoing process. And I think it's encouraging people to really um, identify what your resources are and how how can we be creative and how we meet people's needs using the resources that are available to us. And I think options are, um, having options is a lot of what we try to do is provide options to people for their comfort or for where they receive their care. And so um, options to our staff to be able to provide the care that's needed was kind of what I was trying to provide. So in that case, yes, we did 100% provide more options for our, our patients that are under our care. And, and we, keep, we keep metrics too. I don't know if Jane, you want to share some of our metrics, but the next step of this is to find a partner who you could do literally um, good evidence-based work to figure out how to, how to both quantify and qualify this a little bit. But I think it'd be great to share kind of what we've experienced. So yeah, we've had this contract for a little over a year with the Goodwin Hospice, we've helped, uh, we've supported 87 of their families uh, with 446 encounters. And of those 446 encounters, just about 40 were phone calls. Most are in person. Average um, time, extra time that we spend with a uh, family is 4.8 hours. So, um, and then we have some qualitative measurements that we've done. Um, emotional support, you know, was offered in 276 visits and uh, 88 caregivers were provided with respite, you know, things like that. So we do have a community care record that we enter in this data and we pull out, enter in these uh, metrics and we pull out the data to show uh, the impact and the success. But as you know, numbers don't, don't tell at all. And we have, I have awesome stories to tell, uh, you know, helping folks. We had, we have one woman we're supporting who when the NP went in to uh, recertify her, he asked her what, in one word, what did the doula support mean to her? And she said, family. 
So, you know, someone said the doula was like um, warm air, knowing where it's needed. Yeah. That was a quote mm. from a, from a good one um, patient, patient's son, I should say. So it Alex, sounds like there's a the... need for more evidence um, in order to uh, sort of justify expansion and policy to cover death doulas nationally or even on a state-by-state -state basis or insurance-by-insurance -insurance basis. Uh, I have a question about the role of doulas uh, in states where medical aid and dying is legal. We just did a podcast about medical aid and dying in Canada. We'd previously done a couple other podcasts about medical aid and dying. So we've had guests with varying perspectives, um, many pro, some ambivalent, some opposed. Uh, no matter your perspective, I wonder what the role is for death doulas, end of life doulas in states where it's legal, like or territories. I think D.C. It's legal, and it there's a proposal for it to be made legal in Virginia, um, where two of you are based. I don't believe it's legal in Massachusetts. It's not. Um, so, uh, thoughts about that? The role of death doulas in those sort of situations. So, um, I have supported many medical aid and dying um, folks in D.C. because I'm eight miles from the border uh, in Virginia to D.C. I believe that doulas are perfectly positioned to be at the bedside with uh, someone who's doing medical aid and dying. I um, There's a physician, uh, one physician in D.C. who basically is doing, doing the prescriptions and um, I got connected with her and we have a really nice partnership and uh, she refers her patients to me when a family believes that they wouldn't want a support partner, a doula in this process. So usually there's a couple meetings beforehand and then um, the day of, you know, their support the day of. So I it's gone extraordinarily well. It's, it's, it's actually transformational for me to be there and to do that with someone um, you know, a son didn't want to be there in the room when she took the drink and I was there. And so it, it, you know, I've really supported a lot of awesome people, the people that have chosen to do this. I respect, uh, autonomy and dignity at end of life. And I'm, I'm a full supporter in medical aid and dying. Um, so that's my experience, but I think doulas are perfectly positioned to be support in that area. Okay. We're, we're wrapping up in the last couple of minutes. I just want to here is kind of when you think about doulas, end of life doulas, where we are, kind of the nation around this, what are you hoping for? What's like next? I'm going to turn to John first. Like if you had a magic wand, John, and you so, uh, anything I, around I, end of life doulas, what would you be using it on? So I have three things. One is I think they should be included and paid for in IDT teams. I think they have enough differentiation. That will be over time that I think they should be part of ID teams and recognized as that. Two, I think doula training should be built into every professional school, uh, medical school, nursing school, yeah. um, wherever people are taking care of folks. I think there should be some aspect of that. Uh, in the end, I don't think you should be worth certifying palliative and hospice unless you've had doula training. But I'm a little bit on the edge on that. And, th and then lastly... I really do want to find a way to incorporate and get folks who have traditionally not seen hospice as a, a viable path forward yeah. to have those folks they really trust understand the benefits of Goodwin Hospice and others uh, in a way. And I think doulas can lead that that effort. So, and John, just I'm going to push you on a little bit too, because I, uh, you know, I'm wondering if we think about payment structure for this. Right. Is that if, if anybody currently can just say, "Hey, I'm an end of life doula," or you you take a you know a couple hour course and you call yourself an end of life doula, I worry that that may open things up to fraud. I mean, we're even seeing that obviously in in structured programs like hospice. But like, if anybody can hang up that shingle, uh, do you worry about that? Um, I don't. I do not. I, I I think that the I think the market and others will determine those individuals. And who they work with, I have I have faith in the system of of the hospices and the individuals to say they're bringing worth or not. Yeah. Again, uh, I think it's one of those issues that I mean, Goodwin Hospice is not going to bring in people to be hospices and their IDT teams unless they're proven their structure and they can follow that. Yeah. And so I think there's that aspect of it. And the reality is that there's someone who hangs up their shingles is not a great doula, but it helps that individual. Yeah, that that we're works. Okay with that. I'm okay with again. This is this is human based care. All right, right. Um, yeah. Beth. I'm going to turn to you. 
the, yeah. the magic wand running out a little steam, just used three times, but it's got some energy left in it. <laughs> I personally think it would be great if we could find ways, creative ways to be able to meet the needs of people who are at end of life. That's obviously where my focus is, but people who are faced with serious illness or at end of life and really to have more support going through that process that's not just based on um, you know creative thinking because we're just not going to have enough staff. Yeah. So I think you know being realistic about how many people are going to need care and how many people are going to be here to provide care, um, I think we need to be creative and and to realize that there are people with appropriate training that can help meet needs. There's I love lot. the creativity you're showing too, Beth. Uh, amazing job, uh, amazing job to go to the hospice too. Okay, Jane, you're the last one. A little sparks left from the magic wand. Yeah, yes. one one thing. Um, we need to look outside the box. We need to find untraditional um, workforce to fill in the needs of the of the um, of folks getting older as we age. We need we need more help, as Beth said. The system mm-hmm. needs more help. Well, I want to thank all three of you, but before we end, maybe we can get a little bit more Jimmy Bobbitt. Woo. To my friends who are jolly When melancholy knocks Sometimes they let her in To sit and share stories Of flops and of glories It ain't half as bad as the bends Sometimes living's a struggle And multiplied double But they love it too much for the party to end A bubble's up, they will point you toward home No matter how deep or how far you roam They will show you the surface, the plot and the purpose So when the journey gets long Just know you are loved There is light up above And joy there is always enough A bubble's up Wonderful. John, how did he do as a parrot head? Fantastic. He's going to have his own parrot head following. (laughs) (laughs) Jane, Beth, John, thank you for joining me on the Jerry Pell Podcast. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much. much. And to all of our listeners, thank you for your support of the podcast. And we'd also like to thank all of our listeners who've donated more than $250, including... Dwayne Dobschutz, Frisch Brandt, My Lasting Letters, Kelly Strait, Daryl Owens, Roseanne Leipzig, Elizabeth Chung, Emise Shimoji, Harry Hahn, Nick Schneeman, Ed Martin, Jeff and Lena Galbraith, Himashu Mahotra, Nina Flanagan, Penelope Thompson, Lloyd Wolstadt, Mark Wren, Carol Heyman, Bob Rixey, Patrick Lally, Annie Hargadon, Susan Nelson, and Sharon Brangman. Thank you all.